Across time and space, there have been stories that have transcended every single generation and every single civilization on this big blue rock floating through space. Stories that are ingrained in our brains since birth. Snow White, Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast, Little Red Riding Hood. And today I bring you something a little more adult, a little more sinister. From the collection of Fable itself, this is my first deep dive into any of these stories and it's been something that has really perplexed my mind. After playing the Telltale series, The Wolf among Us, a very fantastic game that even if you are not a gamer yourself, I really urge you to go play that, as it's mostly like playing a TV show or a movie, but getting to actually decide all the choices and seeing how these different things play out in the end. Now this isn't a regular Fables comic, as usually those take in a more modern era of a city, with Bigsby the Wolf, Snow White, all these characters that we come to know and love, but this one more deals with Snow White herself, when she actually goes across the desert after a thing called the darkness is taking over Fable Town, and what she's trying to do is find a sanctuary for her people before this darkness spreads ever more. Now talking to the Sultan of this desert city, Snow White gets put in a position where she needs to constantly be telling this man stories to avoid her own beheading. And while this is extremely interesting, the thing that I want to show you is just the very first story out of it. The story of what Snow White did after she left the cabin with the seven dwarves and what actually became of her life. Now this story has some very tragic points to it, some very funny things as well, and it's just something that I really enjoyed. And I gotta say the artwork on top of all this is absolutely fantastic. It looks like a very old painting, and almost every single character portrayed in this is also very interesting. The dwarf race itself, a collective of beings that just kind of live under the earth, just constantly mining for iron and steel and gemstone, and actually trading it to the humans above, gives this story a pretty good twist. And when this trade agreement is put into harm's way, we actually get to see a story of Snow White, her revenge, as well as her husband trying to protect his own city. This story is called The Fencing Lessons, and it all begins in a marriage. A marriage between Snow White herself and Prince Charming. Know, O King of the Age, that long ago and far away, a beautiful maiden was rescued from varied trials and tribulations by a handsome prince. They were very much in love and happy in each other. And after this beautiful wedding occurs, we get to see Snow White as well as Prince Charming sitting in their own room after consummating their marriage, and Snow White tells them that she was promised any gift in the world that she wants. Prince Charming just kind of goes on to say that yes, my darling, but hopefully this won't be anything I regret, surely. And what she actually wants is some fencing lessons. No, nothing so extravagant as that. I want fencing lessons. Really? Why? Among the assembled chivalry of your, I mean our kingdom, you're reputed to be most deadly with a blade. That should make you a suitable teacher. And again, I ask why? Because you promised me anything, and this is my heart's desire. I don't want to say more for now. Secrets already? Our palace intrigues next? But really, darling, as for something else, sword fighting isn't a fit activity for ladies or the gentry. For any woman, in fact. It was Snow White's husband just trying to usher away from these fencing lessons, as he doesn't want to be made a laughing stock by his peers, and he also doesn't really know why she wants these in the first place. She begins to dig her heels in the ground, and he finally relents, agreeing to these sword fighting lessons, and from here on out, we are just is going to be kind of seeing a montage of Snow White and her husband just teaching themselves in the middle of the night when nobody else is around to look. Make no mistake about it, sword fighting is war, writ small and personal, but war all the same, and all warfare has one proper goal. What is that? Victory. Even so, but how is it achieved? The only honorable purpose of war is to destroy your enemy's ability to make war. Do less, and you risk delivering yourself into hands. Do more, and you entertain depravity. And with this little bit of philosophy, we see Prince Charming saying, to hell with it. Let's just go to the practical lessons. And as they go chopping and stabbing in the middle of the night, Snow White's skills do not really improve the first time around. He becomes a little more irritated, but with the next couple of pages, we will be cutting over to just the kingdom in general itself. We see some guards passing, and they're on their way to go talk with the civilization below, the dwarves, and a trade agreement that has been going on for ages. The dwarves dwell below and work their mines, digging iron, gold, silver, precious stones, and other diverse treasures out of the earth. These they traded for food, linen, red meat, and all the other necessities from above. I see the harvest was good this year. It was chiefly these treasures from the underworld that made the land above so rich among the kingdoms of men. 
And as this trade agreement goes, we learn a little bit more about the kingdom itself and some rather depraved agreements that they have going on. Talking about how some of these dwarves don't really care about sitting down in the deep darkness of the earth. And how sometimes they would like to sit in the sun. And with a couple negotiations, this is made doable. They have all these different cabins spread out in the woods. These places where the seven dwarves themselves had resided in the past. Where any dwarf could go and stay. And that any yeoman, any chief, any marshal, any authority of the kingdom would turn a blind eye. And this is where we'll start to see some very dark things going on. It cuts over to these two soldiers walking past this cabin way out in the woods. And as one soldier is remarking that they should probably go check this out and make sure that there's no scandals in there, no highway robbers or ne'er dwellers. And as he does so, the yeoman ahead of him just tells him to keep going, to ignore this. That is surely safe and fine. And as they leave, we are cutting down into the inside of this cabin. We see two dwarves just kind of stooping underneath the window, hoping not to be seen, as we see a young peasant girl standing in the bed. Something at first glance that just kind of made me gasp as I wasn't quite sure what was going on here, but apparently girls and women are traded to these dwarves to have themselves a good old time as long as nobody is getting hurt and everything is remaining consensual and the trade agreements go on. One of the dwarves asks the other if he thinks that the soldiers had seen them or not, and the other one says he has no idea that the things that men do are so very strange. And as we move on from here, we are back with Prince Charming and Snow White themselves having a few more fencing lessons as Snow White is getting just a little bit better. Don't leap forward and start jabbing willy-nilly. Straighten your arm first, then let your lunge guide your blade to its target. Fine, you win. I confess I've got no talent for this. You'll improve. You're a touch better today than yesterday, and yesterday you were a smidgen better than the day before. Now, resume your stance. And as a few days pass and fencing lessons continue, we see Prince Charming just kind of wandering around the kingdom, just making sure everything is on tip-top shape, making sure that no crime has been committed, and on his travels along with his guard, they come across a very mangled body, one that has essentially just been torn to pieces by a very misguided blade. God's wounds! He's been hacked in pieces! It's hard to tell, Sheriff. Wasn't that a dwarf? Yes, your grace. It's one of the underfolk for sure, so at least it's none of our lookout. It's some grim business between them and their kind, except that it happened above ground in our land. I've little doubt that the king under the earth will want to know what occurred here. You'll still have to investigate. And as a week goes on, they find yet another dwarf body, the second one in a row. And this time, it's not quite as hacked up, but it's been stabbed to death in so many different wounds that Prince Charming himself can't help feel a little bad about this. He says that they must have missed every single vital in his body, hence why they're all over the ground. And as he talks about this poor, poor soul, his yeoman beside him tells him that dwarves don't really have souls, or at least that is what he's been told. Prince Charming knows that this needs to come to an end, that surely if this continues, their trade agreements will be over, and that the king under the earth is going to want a little more than red meats and wines and fine linens. He looks to his yeoman beside him, and he starts telling him to throw every single thief, every cutthroat, and any villain in the kingdom that he can possibly come up with. And as a few more days go on, we see Prince Charming once again, strolling through the woods with his entourage, as a white horse and a female on top of its back go flying through the wilderness. Look, there's a lone rider there! That's my bride on her daily ride. Seems she's outrun her guards and attendants again. She takes perverse pleasure in it. My fault, I suppose, for giving her such a spirited horse. There are advantages, sire, to having both mounts and wives with willful spirits. True, Sir Dunzark. So, very true. And a few more days go by, and we're just seeing more and more of these fencing lessons as Snow White is just getting better and better, day by day and week by week. We see her and Prince Charming giving a very honorable duel, and as she's slicing and trying to stab at him, and she ends up getting a little bit worried that she's actually going to pierce this man, and he basically just tells her that this is not going to happen unless he wants it to. He tells her that when the time comes for worry, that they'll put blunts on their tips, and they will have themselves a true duel. When suddenly somebody knocks, it's the middle of the night, and Prince Charming has absolutely no idea who this could possibly be. And when he opens the door, it is merely just the Chamberlain telling him that the Dwarf King below wants to see him this instant. And him just kind of reluctant that it's the middle of the night, he doesn't really understand, and he is made aware that underneath the earth there is no sunlight, and that dwarves kind of follow a different kind of schedule, and that he must make haste immediately. Immediately. Now from here on out, we'll be following Prince Charming into this cavernous world underneath the earth. And as he kind of tells his men that he should go alone, they all just kind of ask him if this is even a safe idea. And he basically tells them that even if they are down there, if these dwarves decided to turn, that just a couple more blades would not be enough. And he's just kind of walking down all these trails. He's being escorted by a few dwarves holding these very cool looking torches. They look like just glass bulbs with a beam of light inside of them.
to them, and these things will kind of come in later as the dwarves train for something a little more sinister. But as he's looking down at this world below, we are getting to see this vast city underneath the earth, and Prince Charming himself doesn't really know what to think about this. He had no idea that such extravagant architecture even existed down here, and that maybe these people are just a little more advanced than he thought. And as he's being escorted, they finally meet their destination after walking miles and miles underneath the earth, and we will be getting to see the Dwarf King himself, a very spooky looking man, and this is where I gotta say, the artwork in this is just so fantastic. The depictions of all these different creatures, as well as the humans, as well as just the land around them, remains to be something like a picture out of a renaissance fair. And while I haven't checked out very many of the Fable comic books, I'm very interested to actually see more of these. I don't know if this is the only one that kind of goes back to almost medieval times. Times, but this book alone and all of its different stories managed to be such an awesome read and it's something that I highly recommend you go pick up for yourself. Greetings Tosh King Under the Earth. It's unfortunate that we finally meet under such dire circumstances. Greetings to you, Prince of the Kingdom Above. These are indeed deadly times. Four bodies and as many weeks. It seems my subjects aren't safe in your world. Not by any policy of our court. These murders are the doings of criminals and we're in the process of hunting them down. Then do it quickly, Prince of men. Our patience is limited. It would be unfortunate if the long peace between our two kingdoms was threatened by these evil deeds. Perhaps you can be of help in our investigation, King Tosh. Can you identify the victims for us and point out anything that they held in common? What we're thinking is that if we could discover why these particular doors were slain, that might tell us something of the killers. A reasonable inquiry, Prince. We'll direct you to our Chamberlain for such intelligence. And as we're looking at this giant bulbous head of King Tosh himself, we're cutting over to the next page where Prince Charming has finally left. And his soldiers just kind of ask him what he learned. And he begins to start telling them about how if they don't find this killer, that war will start to rampage the lands between both of them. And that he has found out some information about these different dwarves, that four of them were in fact brothers. And that there is actually three more. Now, you might start thinking this is a little strange. We have four brother dwarves, all slain, and three more that remain. And this is indeed the seven dwarves that Snow White has been known to live with, and all the stories we've been told since we were kids. And this is where I started thinking that things are getting just a little bit weird, as it's starting to seem like these dwarves may have been slain for a reason, and the only person that really comes to mind, obviously, and apparently not to Prince Charming himself, would be Snow White, even though in all the movies, and all the stories we've been told, they have been nothing but helpful. But in a medieval world like this, in a book so such as fables, this could not possibly be the situation. And Prince Charming basically decrees that every single one of these diversion cabins must be searched. And as all of his men exclaim that there are dozens of these cabins throughout all the forests in all of the kingdom, he merely says that they better get on it. And with the next couple of nights, Prince Charming will be plagued with different nightmares. More bad dreams? You haven't been sleeping well, husband, ever since you returned from the underworld. I'm just a little overworked these days. Nothing for you to worry at. It seems preventing a war depends on solving these murders, but we've hit one dead end after another. Such black deeds can't go on forever, and from what you tell me, these were not upright citizens of any race, dwarf or man. Surely they won't be missed down below. If these were just normal murders, committed down in their darkened halls, it wouldn't matter to anybody higher than some lowly constable or magistrate. But a king must protect even his most depraved subjects from the outside of danger. It's his most basic duty to his people. The mere fact that the killer is likely someone of our race is enough to warrant their king's attention. Such lofty matters are beyond my understanding, but I will do one thing to help. And as Snow White is trying to appease and to calm her lovely husband, she tells him that she will no longer need any of these fencing lessons. That basically she has reached her peak with any kind of blade, and that there would be no point for any more lessons. And Prince Charles just kind of reluctantly sighs, and and he says, yes, this will be most helpful, and if at any time after these dark, dark times you wish to continue the art of the blade, just let me know. And as another couple days go by, we are seeing another trade agreement between the dwarves and the humans, although this time there has been a bit of a cancellation. I'm sorry, Lord Carrick, but we have no goods to trade today. But why? This trading day was scheduled well in advance by your emissaries and ours. What could be the cause of your delay? There's no delay, noble lord. This is a cancellation. The king under the earth has commanded a cessation of all mining and gems and fine metals and all production of trade goods for the world of men. Now, we mine cold iron only. Now, our craftsmen fashion swords, axes, armor, and other implements of war. But why would you do such a thing? We're at peace with each other. For now, but all things change. Even the stone in the earth is a constant movement for anybody patient enough to notice. 
Goodbye, Lord Garrick. I hope the next time we meet, we're not peering at each other over the locked shields of our facing battle ranks. And I gotta say, one thing that I really enjoyed about this book is how much the dwarves kind of protect each other. There's been merely four different murders, and while this may not be exactly a lot, even though murder is a murder and it's never a good thing, their king cares very much, and he's actually willing to throw out this long trade agreement, this long peace that has been going on for centuries, all in the name of protecting his people. And with the next couple of pages, we're actually going to see something very funny. As both kingdoms are kind of training against each other's different ecosystems, we see the land of men putting bandages over their soldiers' eyes and trying to train them in the art of fighting in the dark. And as a lot of them don't really understand, they all just kind of tell them, how do you expect to fight a dwarf in the darkness of their own caverns? And with that, we are cutting over to the dwarves as the same exact thing is going on. In slew of bandanas over their eyes, they're learning to fight with the glass orbs with a bean of light inside of them right directly and from their faces, trying to learn how to fight in the open air of the earth. And once again, their men are just as confused, as they're all completely blinded, and they've never had to do such a thing, but with their commanders, they basically just tell them that how are they meant to fight above the earth in the man's land, and that surely if they are fighting underground, that means that they are actually losing the war. But as we move through the days, and the tidings of war, and the beating of drums, all the tension in the kingdom is at an all-time high. The sanctity of their peace between these two kingdoms is about to be tarnished over a lone murderer. And as the rumors continue to spread, finally the king of men, Prince Charming's own father eventually hears about this and he summons his son. But as he's going on, we get this hilarious scene where Prince Charming is kind of walking past all these different princesses as they're basically just trying to get this man to sleep with them now that he is a married man. We haven't seen you here since your wedding day, Prince Charming. Is your bride wearing you out so much that you've no more attention to spare for us? What can I say, lovely Daphne? I'm an old married man now. All my adventures are done and my rascally day's over. My future is rich in walking sticks, rocking chairs, and quiet nights by a warm fire. I can't believe that, Prince of Heartbreakers. Isn't there a single indiscretion still flickering faintly within you? Remember those roguish hints of inquiry about the three of us all at the same time? A fanciful bachelor's dream of possibilities, which I recall you steadfastly described as impossibilities at the time. At the time, you were still eligible and each of us still entertained hopes of landing you for our very own. But now... And after these three lusty princesses are trying to get their way with Prince Charming, the Chamberlain of the King comes in, and he saves young Prince Charming from the depths of their claws. Rescued again by the High Chamberlain's good timing, my virtue is saved. Good day, ladies. And as Prince Charming walks into the courtyard, he is greeted to the king. So, is there going to be war, my son? I don't know yet, father. But day by day, it looks more likely. And is our army up to the task? We're getting there. My time is split training with them and overseeing the investigation into the dwarf murders. And how is that going? Slowly, I'm afraid. But I'm determined to have the culprits in custody before long. Hopefully before we are called to arms. War with the kingdom under will be disastrous for the both of us. No matter who wins. We've grown too comfortable on their riches, spent too long becoming dependent on each other. Perhaps that needs to be changed. Not yet, father. I pray not yet. And as we're reaching closer and closer to the end of our story, Prince Charming is getting ever more desperate to solve what's going on, to stop this fluctuating war between them, or at least the appearance of such things. And what happens next is actually a very smart idea, as he comes to start actually realizing what is going on, as stories begin to collide in his mind. We are out in the forest again, and we see Prince Charming and his men actually staying around one of these diversion cabins. Except this time it's been completely burned down, and what it's invested they actually find three more bodies of these dwarves. And realizing that these three were actually stabbed one singular time in the heart each before this place was actually burned down, and they kind of realize that the only reason this would be burned down would be to kind of hide these murders, as obviously the killer knows that he's being investigated and that something very huge is about to stir up from below the earth. And suddenly Prince Charming just kind of realizes, hmm, seven dead dwarves, all brothers. Where have I possibly heard this before? And with this sudden thought, he goes back to the kingdom's courtyard and he demands audience with the warden. You, you sent for me, sire. Who's the most vile creature we have currently locked away downstairs? Why, I, I guess that would be the highwayman, Blackbriar Johnny. He cut down a dozen travelers along the king's road before we caught him last year, sentenced to be hanged on the public gibbet. But we've put it off, still hoping to coax the location of some of the lost plunder from him. Well, clean him up, then have his head lopped off in secret, and bring it here to me in a bag. And also, have these papers witnessed by yourself and our Jack Ketch. It's his confession on how and why he killed the seven dwarves these past months. 
fill his name in where it's appropriate. And with Prince Charming finally realizing what's going down, he kind of blackmails the Warden, as when he actually tells the Warden to do so, the Warden just merely says that there is no possible way that this Blackbriar John could have possibly done this, that he's been in custody this entire time, for the past year in fact. And Prince Charming basically does not give a shit, alright? He basically tells him, if Warden, if you would like to keep your job as well as your head, we'll do exactly what I say, and you will do this all in secrecy. And this is exactly what happens. Charming receives the hat in the bag, as well as the signed notes. He sends both of these things off with his right-hand man, Dunzerk, and it is delivered to the king underneath the earth. And things in the kingdom seem to go back to normal. All these tidings of war and bloodlust are seeming to fall underneath the belt, and nobody really remembers any of this anymore. Trading begins, all these luxuries are returning back to both kingdoms, and nobody could be any happier, besides Prince Charming himself, as he's realizing that he's basically been duped this entire time. And with the next couple of pages, we will see this young man riding up to his wife in the middle of this field, along with all of her friends. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I borrow my wife for a few minutes? What's the matter, husband? You look stricken. No, it's good news, actually. We've just received the Dwarf King's envoy who informs us that the king is satisfied with our justice. That's wonderful news. How then is your countenance so darkened? No one likes to be played for a fool, especially by himself. I let my own prejudice keep me from recognizing obvious truths until it was too late to save anyone. For example, I assumed the killer had to be a man. And as he says this, Snow White just kind of gets a smirk on her face and she just starts saying that she doesn't really understand. The first dwarf victim was hacked to death in the most clumsy and brutal way. But by the final murders, the killer needed only a single thrust to do his mortal work, as if he was inexperienced at first, but perfecting his deadly art all along, much like your progress, and remarkably over the same amount of time. And with this, Snow White basically knows that the jig is up, that she has essentially been caught, but she still continues to just kind of play this off, and she just asks him if he is accusing her of something, and he just tells her no. Nothing but coincidences. When I found you in that cottage, you told me you were all alone, just hiding out there. I was, but I'm not surprised somebody else moved in. I'd imagine any abandoned cottage would eventually attract opportunistic squatters. Yes, I'm certain that's what happened. I'm tempted to ask if you ever knew those dwarves. My better judgment reminds me that we all have secrets best kept to ourselves. Yes, my husband. Though I love you dearly, and I will obey you in all else, I told you long ago some details about my past life will follow me to my grave. Not everything about your past, though. Didn't you tell me once you had a twin sister? Let's send for her to come live with us in the palace. You need a companion to share confidences and to keep you company on those long rides you love so much. Trust there's no longer a need to take them alone. And this is the end of our story, and ultimately something that I found really awesome. Awesome. I really enjoyed the story of vengeance between Snow White and this devastating story about what these dwarves do in these diversion cabins. And uh, while it is very dark, I think Fables remains to be an extremely unique set of tales. Taking all these stories that we knew since we were children and bringing them back to us in a more adult-oriented way is something that I very much appreciate. And it's something that I want to see more and more of. And something I really recommend. I do believe that this is a company and a group of artists and writers that truly deserve your money. And if you could go out and maybe purchase one or two of these things just to support these people, to let them know how much we enjoy this kind of writing, I think that would be absolutely fantastic. I'm pretty sure they're still doing runs to this day, I know it's been around for a while, and if you actually want to see something more interactive, I very highly recommend that you go play The Telltale's The Wolf Among Us. It's a very visually appealing game, and something that I'm really surprised hasn't already been made into a movie or a TV show, as that's basically what it is, just with a little bit of gameplay added in, and the choice to actually decide different decisions that Bigby the Wolf gets to do, and while we didn't get to see him in this story, he is an extremely likable character, and one that I think you will find to be very unique. He actually appeared in a Batman vs. Bigby comic book that actually talked about in the 10 comics to form an addiction video that I did a while ago. And I just think it's something that's so solely unique that anybody who enjoys graphic novels or comic books deserves to read such a thing. Now, this is Fables 100 Nights of Snowfall, and this all actually centers around Snow White trying to keep this Sultan from actually destroying her, as there's a very dark story being tied in between these. And while I do say dark a lot, it's also very funny, and
and very heartwarming at the same time. But this specific book remains to be very good. While it does have about three or four different short stories in a comic book format, it's also a tiny little book inside with just written text and a few illustrations. But anyways, everybody, I'm starting to ramble again. So if you did enjoy the video, please like. If you're new, subscribe to the channel. It would help me out a great deal. And most importantly, thank you all so much for watching in the first place. It means so very much to me. Uh, I get really excited when I'm posting these videos because I know I'm going to get to talk to you guys down in the comments. But with that, I bid you a very good day. And if you could, go down in the comments and actually tell me what was your favorite fairy tale when you were growing up. Is there any one that you think nobody really knows about? Is there any version that you think is solely lost to the world? But anyways, everybody, like always, from the heart, have yourself a very fantastic day, and thank you so much for watching.